All right, so welcome to week nine. Uh, break is over. Uh, we're literally in the second half, running towards the end. Uh, we are starting with database security uh, today. And now my clicker stopped working. There we go. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the principles of database security. And then I'll talk about the mechanical side of it. Okay, so database security failure. When a database is compromised, it usually ends up with one of the following results. Good. So I just have to start the lecture. That's all it is. Right, so when a database gets compromised, it usually ends up with one of the following results. A breach, data is stolen. I can pretty much guarantee everybody in this room has heard of at least one data breach in the last three years. There's been doozies. Uh, there's some, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been some really good ones. Uh, when Equifax got compromised a few years ago, that was a good one. Um, the Bank de Desjardins bank got compromised. That was also a very good one because that was people's literally banking information. Um, then there's data loss when somebody decides to, you know, destroy the data because they're disgruntled or they're assholes or they have nothing else better to do while they sit in their mother's basement. Or it's a worst case scenario where they steal the stuff and then destroy evidence behind them. Um, that has actually happened to a few companies over the years. Um, one of the recent ones, I can't remember the name of the game company, but there's a, a game, a company that makes games that basically had their database compromised and they got credentials. So they were able to get into the network and then they started deleting stuff off their servers. Um, yeah. So it's bad. <laughs> Which way you count cut cut it, it's bad. So what are some of the damages of a security failure? Loss of intellectual property. So having private private data leaked can be really a bad thing, you can imagine. For example, source code. Somebody breaches uh, your one of your database servers figures out some user credentials, uses that to get into the server to the rest of the network, and then they uh, steal your source code. Um, who has it happened to recently? Rockstar is an example of one company that had that happened to them. Um, uh, Project CD uh, CD uh, Pro, CD Project Red also got had. Uh, there's been a few that was just regular software. Um, damage to corporate image and reputation. Uh, having to admit that your security was inadequate can be really damaging depending on who you are. So if you are a company that specializes in holding people's financial information and you get breached, it's, it's not a good look. Um, business continuity. So data loss can literally kill a company or cripple things until it's restored. Depending what the business does, if the data gets stolen and destroyed, or the data is compromised and encrypted, and then, you know, good old uh, the encryption scams, for some companies, that can literally be the end. They, if they don't have their source code anymore, they can't produce a product anymore, and they don't have any way to pay the ransom, they're done. Or if it's a company that at least has decent backup protocols, they might be crippled until you know they get everything back up and secured uh penalties for non-compliance that's an interesting one so there's around the world in almost every country uh there's regulations that can cause a company to get fined uh in the u.s there's the sorbanes oxley um most people in here probably don't know what that is um how many people here actually recognize the name enron Okay, source being Oxley is because of Enron. Um, essentially, Enron cooked the books. They faked their data. They went under and wiped out tons of financials in North America. So they brought in rules for managing financial data in North America. PCI DSS. 
PCI DSS is the organization that um, controls credit card transactions online. So if you're going to take credit cards online, your application, your website, whatever, must be PCI DSS compliant. If you're not and a data breach happens, they're going to fine you into oblivion. Um, HIPAA. Uh, well, Canada has something equivalent to that. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but HIPAA is basically the American uh, health in health industry, privacy, health industry, privacy, something, something. Um, essentially, it's the guarantee that your data, your medical data is private. And if your insurance company gets compromised and your medical records get leaked, it's a HIPAA violati violation and whatever organization manages that is going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. Um, GDPR, that's one that some of you should know. How many of you have heard GDPR? A little bit. Anybody here from Europe? If you're from Europe, you should know about GDPR. They're the ones that made it. Uh, it's the uh, General Data Protection, I don't remember what the R stands for, uh, regulations. Uh, essentially, it's guarantee that a person's data is private it can be destroyed if they ask for it to be destroyed and if you don't secure a person's private data and it gets leaked whatever organization is behind gdpr will come down on you so make sure things are secure is a good thing because um i know of at least one company in toronto who got nailed by uh three different sets of rules at the same time like their fines were in the tens of millions of dollars. Considering they were barely making ends meet as it was, that basically bankrupted the company. And the data breach was small by, you know, modern standards. And then there's recovery and damage mitigation costs. Fixing your shit. Takes time. Takes money. Because time is money. You got to pay your staff to bring things back. If they don't know how to bring it back, you got to pay someone else to come and do it, and they're going to charge you even more. Communicating with your customers costs money because you got to do all the press releases. You got to do all that, you know, fluffy comms with your customers. And of course, it's a potential loss of business where, you know, your reputation just took a shit kicking. So suddenly people stop buying your stuff because they don't trust you anymore until they forget. Usually it's like three weeks. But, you know, most humans have the attention span of a hamster. So, but, you know, those three weeks to three months to whatever number of years, as depending what it is, can really hurt your bottom line and you're going to lose a lot of money. All right. All right. Common threats. So the first, the biggest threat is insider threats. Uh, a malicious employee. That's someone who hates the company that you're, that's working there and they leak your source code. They leak your customer data to your competitors, basically industrial espionage. <laughs> Somebody's just got fired and they were stupid and they let the person get out of keyboard after they got fired. If ever you work in a place and you're in charge of firing someone, make sure they don't get to touch computer after they get the, your out the door message. Um, negligence. Somebody just wasn't doing their job. And again, corporate spy slash infiltrator. Uh, that happens way more than you'd think. Um, and then there's, you know, the the other kind of spying that happens before the fact, which is out of the people's hands of control. Like, um, how many of you heard the stories about the old Nortel buildings in Bell's Corners? When Nortel went under, the D&D decided they bought one of the big campuses in Bell's Corners to use as their new headquarters. As they started doing renovations, they found cameras and microphones embedded in the walls. Um, half of which was Huawei equipment. Um, not picking on a specific company, but it was Huawei. Um, <laughs> there's a reason they're not allowed to sell telecom equipment in Canada anymore. Um, that's corporate espionage. That's security you can't do anything about. But it just shows how, you know, security can be multifactorial. Human error. All right. 
The meat sack at the keyboard is always the weakest link. I guarantee it. Writing passwords on post-it notes because you have absurd password rules and people can't remember their passwords. Did you know that uh, the organization that does recommendations for security has now recommended against rotating people's passwords? Because it got to the point where people can't remember passwords anymore. So you know this whole change your password every three months, six months, nine months, whatever it is? A lot of the security agencies are now recommending against that behavior because people are get, lose their passwords. So they use, they write down their passwords in a book. They stick it on a post-it note and it sits on their desk. It's defeating the point. Um, MFA with a never changing password is 10 times safer than a constantly changing complex password. Um, injection attacks. So that's a man in the middle attack where the data gets modified as it's on its way to your server. Uh, malware. I think we all know what malware is in this day and age. And attacks on backups, which is interesting. It's a different kind of attack where they don't go after your live data. They go after where you keep your stuff archived. And often, how often do you guys check your backups? Okay, well, first, how many of you actually back up your stuff? Okay. How many of you use OneDrive at least? You do know that school gives you a terabyte of online space that's backed up, right? You might want to use that just a little bit. Um, I use OneDrive because I've got a family subscription and it's a terabyte. It's great. But those of us that back up our stuff, for example, you have all your family photos on a hard drive. How many, how many of you keep a backup of that, those family photos on a second hard drive just to be safe? Maybe take it home, make, take it to work and leave it at your desk at work so it's not in the house if it burns down? Right? I'm just saying, like, 20 years of history just because one day the uh, digital fairy decided your hard drive was dead. Backups. But the thing is, is, people make backups, but they don't check their backups if they're good, if they've been accessed or anything. So that's actually a very subtle attack vector where a malicious actor and a malicious employee will not even try to go to the main server. They'll go after the backup tapes or they'll go after the backup solution. Because most backup systems are not as secure as the real server. So then they'll grab a backup of the database and away they go. So. These are the kind of threats you see. So when we want to secure the database, there's multiple steps that you have to take. Let's go access restrictions. Don't let the meat sack in with the server. Administrative and network access, user accounts and service isolation. All right, physical security. A database server, server, blah, mouth doesn't want to work should be held in a secure environment. Physical access should be restricted to a bare minimum of users. Not everybody should be able to hit the buttons on the keyboard where that server is running. Um, key card, pass keys, lock doors. If you don't want to let someone touch the computer, don't let them touch the computer. Uh, key cards are the best because it keeps track of who taps in. And if you set it up properly, they have to tap in and tap out. Um, server room access should be logged. In other words, when they tap in and tap out, we know who was in and out. Um, strangely enough, this is one of the big perks of running your database server in a cloud environment. Like Amazon. Why? You don't have to worry about the physical security of your server. It's not in your building. It's probably not even in the same country. And for those of you that wonder just how secure the hardware is at a, in, say, Amazon, because I'm sure Microsoft is similar. So the buildings where their data centers are, people have to tap in to get into the building. Cool. That sounds pretty normal. Health Canada got to tap in to get into the door there, too. No problem. However, then you got the technicians. They can tap in to get to the consoles, but they might not even be able to get past that point. 
And then you've got other technicians with more permissions that can tap in the doors to the, to the actual data center. And then the racks are locked. They have to tap on the rack to unlock it. So that means even fewer people have those permissions to actually open the door on the server rack. And it's gotten to the point now where they actually have to type in what server they're playing with and tap again to unlock the server out of the rack. So to get to the server, they got to tap them like eight or nine times to prove their identity every step of the way. Um, apparently, it's gone to the point now where not only do they have to tap, they also carry a, um, a security key. I don't know if any of you have ever seen those keys that have numbers on them. And the number change. You know how you got the MFA uh, where you type in a code either off of an, an authentication app like you know Microsoft Authenticator or whatever? Well, these keys do the exact same thing. And so when they tap, they then have to punch in the code that's on the screen. So they actually have to MFA unlocking a server to physically get at it. It's a lot safer than probably what's happening in 90% of businesses in the city here. Um, I know for a fact at SSC, at Place Portage, it's only three taps to get to a server. <laughs> Just saying. But the number of people that can actually get there is very small. Just, just we'll say like, you know, it is tapped and the doors are locked and secured, but it's only three taps. Once you get into the room with the servers, the, the racks are not tap locked. They just, they assume if you can get into the server room, you're good. Um, yeah, just physical access. Um, for example, why do you not want to let somebody have physical access to a server? If they can open up a command prompt, and with an elevated set of credentials. Um, literally, for example, if it was a Postgres database, I could change one line in the file and I don't need a password to access the server anymore. MySQL is you, you put this special entry in a text file and you just restart the service and MySQL will reset the root password. It's, it's not hard. So physical access is the first step. Administrative security. All right, so now we're moving away from physically not letting someone touch the hardware to limiting people virtually touching the equipment. You limit the number of super users. You don't let everybody have super user rights. Administrative accounts should be as limited as humanly possible. That means you give them the bare minimum number of permissions. <clears throat> Use modern methods for security, such as strong passwords, SSL keys, encryption. Now, if a person has physical access to the disks and the disks are not encrypted, passwords, SSL keys, encryption will do absolutely nothing to stop them from getting your data. Just if the physical part of the security process has failed, you're already done. Just don't even bother. Do not pass go. Definitely not collecting $200. It's over. Audit administrative user logins. Almost all server for database servers are allowed to log user logins. So every single time a user connects to the server, it can log when, where they connected, when they connected, and who they were. So then if there was a breach that happened at 1201, and you see that Bob from accounting connected at 12 midnight, but Bob from accounting should not be able to connect, it's probably Bob that stole the stuff off the server. Now, is it actually Bob that did it or Bob's, you know, nasty little teenager? Who knows? But it's someone who did it. Limit where the administrators can log in from. That's another thing. You can limit where a person can log in from. Um, most servers allow you to do it right down to the IP address, to a subnet, to a range of IP addresses, like, you know, like 192.168. Uh, 16 dot one through 10, for example, you can just say it's only allowed to connect from, you know, 10 IP addresses. It will limit potential breaches. If, for example, the servers are on one subnet and nobody can access those servers except if they're on that subnet and all the other users are on a different network. Um, so for example, if somebody's on 192.168.16, because that's the corporate network, and the servers are all running on 192.168.10. 
And that means that nobody from 16 can hit anything on 10, but everything on 10 can talk to each other. So you can segregate them on the network so that people are not allowed to connect from just any machine. And then we get down to this user security side. Restrict application accounts, the bare minimum of accounts required. You don't want to have too many accounts. Um, restrict the number of interactive user accounts and their permissions. Uh, we'll be talking about permissions in a bit. Um, audit user accounts regularly and you audit user access regularly. So the bottom two are actually the most important out of all this. Audit user accounts regularly. That means you're going to, every once in a while, say once a month, you go through all the users that have accounts and you look to see who's still employed. And anybody who's in the user list that is not part of the company anymore needs to be deleted. Uh, you see some users that have been in there for a long time, you might want to double check, make sure that they're actually even still supposed to access the database, et cetera. That's called auditing. Um, you want to audit user access regularly as in you check the logs and suddenly you discover that Bob from accounting has been connecting from uh, Belarus right out of nowhere for some unknown reason, even though he's in Atlanta. That might not be a good thing if he's connecting from a remote office in another country when he's sitting at his desk in Atlanta. That means his account's been compromised. It's not something you need a human to do one by one. You write a script, it reads the logs, anything that's out of the ordinary, it highlights for someone saying, hey, this user has logged in from four different countries in the last two days. Maybe we should shut them down. Maybe have a conversation with them. Maybe they're on a European vacation. They're literally going around every country in this little circle. It's not like in Europe, you can't visit five countries in six hours. Well, because you can. So. All right. So then we have service isolation. You run your database behind a firewall. There's a shocker. Have something there that can stop people from talking to your server. It's a good thing. Separate your database server from your application server. Don't run them on the same machine. Why? If your application gets compromised and they find a way to basically get root access to the operating system, Congrats, they have your database. If they are on two separate servers, they need to compromise the second server now. They might be able to access the database itself, but they can't access the actual server, which will limit what they can do. Um, and I think the last one goes without saying, don't let your database server be connected to the internet directly, ever. That, that means that for example, I'm sitting at the school and you're running a MySQL server wherever, and I can literally type in, you know, MySQL dash H, type in the IP address, and then give it some credential connect from here to somewhere else without a VPN, without a secure gateway, without anything. But if I can do it directly from my laptop to whatever that server is doing, you're just asking to be compromised. I mean, that would be comparable to parking your car in Vanier and leaving the windows down and expecting that nobody's going to steal the stuff out of your car. Just saying, for those of you that don't know what, where Vanier is, Vanier is a little bit rough part of town. <laughs> Compared to other cities, Vanier is actually really calm, but it's the best example I've got. The other side would be Mechanicsville. Yeah. Okay. So this is the principles of securing it. Well, notice I didn't give you any specific platform, specific stuff, because these are just the general principles that no matter what database server you're running, these are the things you should take into account. Run it isolated, behind a firewall, limit who can physically touch your server, limit where people can connect from. It doesn't need to be a super detailed list because guess what? Every database product does it different. Of course it does. Therefore, if every database product does it differently, 
it's really hard to teach a course that teaches them all. So we worry about the generics. All right, so users and privileges. So when we talk about users and their privileges, we invoke the concept of the principle of least privilege. It means that a user or a process, could be a process, should have the lowest level of privileges required to perform the assigned task. Oh, in other words, we're limiting access to the lowest possible level required to actually be able to do the job. So, we have an employee that works in accounts receivable. Okay, so they work in the accounting department. And I'm guessing for a lot of people in here, when I said accounts receivable, it was a complete mystery. Uh, you know, they're the ones that collect money for a company. Right. So that person ever need to have access to the customer invoices. And they should only be able to, you know, maybe the customer invoices. They shouldn't be able to, while well, they can probably create new invoices, up the end, but they, for example, shouldn't be allowed to delete the invoices. They would need someone with more privileges to do that. In the sense of, a database application, um, what a lot of people don't realize is when you install a, an application, every user you create for that application is not going to create a database user. It's going to create a user in some table somewhere. And the application itself has a user it uses to talk. So application launches, it connects to the server, and then it communicates through that connection for everything else. That connection should only ever have permissions for the database it's talking to. And it probably shouldn't have any uh, DDL capabilities. So create alter drop, shouldn't have be able to do that. Probably should have, you know, insert update delete, potentially truncate, but that should be the only permissions it has. So basically put it saying a person should only be able to do what the minimum number of rights they should have to be able to do the job they need to do. The more permissions you give to someone, the more risk is involved. Um, trying to come up with an example that's not condescending. Um, yeah, new employees is fine, yeah. So, you know, you got a new junior dev that just came online, just got hired. They've, you know, just graduated from school two weeks before. Are you going to give them access to the production servers? No. Are you even going to give them any kind of access to any server? No. Um, they might have access to the dev environment. Even that will be very limited what they can do there until they prove that they understand their job. Um, that, that, was, that, was, that was a good example. It was way better where, than where I was headed. So there are three kinds of privileges. Administrative privileges. So that provides access to manage the server. It should be very limited and only granted to those who absolutely need it. These are the people that can change the settings of the database server software. They're the ones that can um, create new users, change the permissions of the users, change server parameters, turn the server on and off. The number of users that should be able to do that in any given organization is usually proportional to the size of the organization. If you have less than 100 employees, you should have two people, maybe three. One person that can do it, one person has the backup in case the first person gets hit by a bus. And that's it. A third, because you know, you should always have a backup. <laughs> The third actually should actually be a binder that's in a locked room with, you know, that nobody can touch, that has the hidden user that anybody can use. If both guys, you now both guys are going up for a beer and they both get hit by a bus, you know, you should have at least a, a redundancy there. Um, database privileges. So those are the ability to execute commands at database level, such as drop. Um, you guys know what the drop command is, right? You learned that last semester. You know, drop table, poof, everything's gone. And it doesn't even ask you if it's going to go away. It just goes away. These you know, you can go 
drop name of database and everything just disappears and you pray you have a backup. Um, again, the number of those users should be very limited, not necessarily limited as the ones that can literally turn off the server, it should be very limited. <clears throat> then we have a database level privileges, which is the ability to access tables, indexes, and views. They can, you know, insert, update records, possibly modify the table structure of inside of a single database. So, you know, it goes from big privileges down to fine grained. So user administration. User access can be controlled when the user is created. So in pretty much all database servers, you create a user and then you can, after the user has been created, you can set rules of where they're allowed to access the server from. Um, an IP address can be specified so the person can only ever access from a one location. Um, So if your user has access to the database server directly, we can restrict it to just be a specific subnet so that if they're coming in from a different subnet, they're limited. Um, there's been a few places I've seen over the years. Um, the place I used to work before I went over to where I am at now, uh, if we wanted to access the physical database servers, like, gotta be careful, access anything that wasn't in our AWS environment, we actually had to VPN inside the network from our machine to the private subnet where the servers lived. So that meant that most users couldn't even hit the servers, except through, you know, specific port 80 or port 443 for the web services or, you know, whatever for Samba, whatever port that is, 431, no, 431's for printing, whatever. Um, so if I wanted to access one of the database servers that was running on a physical server, I had to run the VPN client and connect to a VPN on the internal network. And then I was authorized to access the database server. It's kind of cool because the servers are safe, right? They're living in their own little bubble. Um, when a user is first created, they don't have any privileges. Literally the user exists and they are not allowed to do anything. After the user is created, then you give them permissions. So you create the user, determine where they're allowed to access from, and then you start giving them rights. So in MySQL, I'm gonna go specific here. Um, and this is basically the same for MariaDB. Create user, username at host identified by password. Um, username is 16 characters long in MySQL and MariaDB. Other database servers have longer usernames. Others have shorter usernames. It is what it is. Host can be a local host, which means it's, you know, the same machine. Uh, an IP address or even a wildcard. So what's the wildcard in SQL? Percent. So if I want to say anybody from 192.168.1 can connect, so you go 192.168.1 percent sign, that means the entire subnet of 192.168.1 can connect to that server. Or I could go .1.12 and only machines from .1.12 can connect. So you can be very specific about where it connects. So an example would be create user Lisa at localhost identified by password. And that means that the user named Lisa can connect from a machine that represents itself as local host. And her password would be literally password. Okay. Obviously don't use the word password. It's an example. Um, local host is a little tricky because not all computers do the whole connect to local host the same way. Some machines will do, literally will respond to local host. Some will come up with uh, 127001. And sometimes some will do the IPv6 address, which I can't remember what it is. It's like colon colon one or something, right? That's IPv6 version. So you often have to create three versions of local host for every user. 
at least for MySQL. Or you turn off IPv6 and that fixes that problem. Um, now, here's one of the nifty things. Uh, this is one of the few things I will give MySQL credit for. And MariaDB, just saying. It is the most flexible one for this scheme. Because in theory, I could go create user Lisa at localhost, identify by password. I could go create Lisa at 192.168.1% sign, identify by other password. And depending where you're coming from, you might actually need different passwords. So that if you know they're accessing from the normal network, they need one password. If they're sitting at the server's keyboard, they need a different password. It's painful to make people remember that many passwords, but it's actually a pretty flexible feature. Uh, Postgres, basically, it's one rule per user per database. But it's still going to be the same password no matter what the rule is for access. So whether you say, hey, they're connecting from a local host, they're connecting from a subnet, they're connecting via Kerberos authentication, whatever they're using to authenticate, it's only a single password. MySQL lets you have different passwords for different hosts. Just a cool trick it does. Um, it's one of the few things I'll say that's really cool about it. Um, changing user passwords. Now, I have an example here. And every semester, I always have at least one student where this doesn't work. And they have to use some alternate syntax. And they basically spend time digging on the MySQL documentation on how to do it. MySQL, for some unknown reason, changed how passwords are changed from when they went from version 5.7 to version 8. And then when they went to 8.1, they changed it a little bit again, staying consistent with their syntax. Uh, but you go alter user, for example, root at localhost, identified by the new password, and it will change the user's password. Uh, you will note the single quote marks. Username's a string, the host name is a string, the password is a string. Just saying, you know. Um, drop user. Drop user Lisa at local host. That means Lisa can no longer log in from local host. But if Lisa has permissions from 192.168.1 wildcard, that user can still connect. That means if you're going to nuke the users, you have to make sure you nuke all the same flavor, all the flavors of the user. This is where that nifty feature I was talking about before becomes really terrible because it adds administrative nightmare if you keep, you know, multiple sets of rules for a person. And a drop user is instantaneous. Like you guys experienced drop table last semester, drop user is just as fast. You drop the user, the user no longer can connect. And you have to redo their account. So there's the create, the alter, and the drop. You'll notice it's DDL-like syntax, not DML-style syntax. It's not insert, update, or delete. It's create, alter, drop. Because users are objects, even though they're records in the table, but they're treated as an object. Um, after you've created the user and you've determined what their password is and where they're allowed to connect from, we then give them permissions. And the commands for that is grant and revoke. Grant and revoke is pretty much the same in all database servers. So the, the create user one is specific to MySQL. Like the example I gave you guys is specific to the lab you're going to do. Okay. Different database servers will do this differently. The syntax is similar, but it's Postgres does it different. Oracle does it really different. Microsoft SQL Server can be very different also because you can actually use Active Directory to give them permissions. You don't even need to touch the database server. You can just say, hey, this person's part of the database group and now they can connect. So create, alter, drop. So far, this example is specific to MySQL for the most part. Grant and revoke is fairly generic. It's pretty much the same syntax for all the servers. So you grant permissions. In other words, you grant the person, you're giving them privileges to the server. And 
when the privileges we have is all, take a guess what all does. Gives them all the permissions. Select means they're allowed to retrieve data. Insert, delete, or update means they can modify the data. And you can do it specific to insert, update, and delete. So you can grant insert, grant update, but not grant delete. That means they can add data, but they can never delete it. Uh, create, alter, drop. That means they can change the database structure. And then MySQL, that last one is MySQL specific. It's usage. Grant usage. The, the user can connect to the server. And then they're done. If they have usage, only usage, that means they, ca they can't actually do anything. They can connect to the server. It authenticates them. And done. I've seen a few strange applications over the years that use something like usage where there's a web application and it actually connects, validates that their user exists in the database server and then switches to the application because they didn't want to manage the username and passwords themselves. Um, it's gross. But the ones we normally worry about is all. And then we have the DM, the DML ones, select, insert, delete, update. And then we have the DDL ones, which just create, alter, and drop. All right. So the syntax is as follows. Um, you grant whatever privileges. You'll notice columns is in uh, brackets. I'll talk about that in a moment. On whatever the object is to whatever user. Theoretically, you can do identified by password. That has had mixed results in my SQL, some unknown reason, even though the documentation says you can do it. It doesn't always work. So try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, just get rid of the identified part. Um, and then I've got a link in the slide to the actual documentation from MySQL. Um, I'm actually going to post a link in the announcement hope I remember, to a website called MySQL Tutorial. And their documentation is 10 times more easy to read than the official documentation for MySQL because the documentation for MySQL covers everything. Every permutation of every single option you can feed to the command. MySQL Tutorial covers what you need. The same. So if I look at the example, Grant all on star. So this is saying is I'm going to grant all privileges on the database called DB Music. Dot star means all tables inside of DB Music to the DB user. And then here we have identified by user pass. Like I said, I've had some students where it worked, some it didn't. And I wish I could say, you know, it worked for the Windows people and it didn't work for the Mac users. No. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. It didn't have anything to do with the platform, and I don't know what it is. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. There's a reason why, you know, permissions and stuff like that is a very niche part of the database industry. Revoke. Revoke the privilege type on object from user. Oh, I meant to go about something earlier. Uh, so revoke insert on dbmusic.star from dbuser. This means that currently on this slide, we gave them all permissions. Now we took their ability away to add stuff, but they can still alter, update, delete, and drop. Kind of actually really stupid permission set, but you know. Um, I meant to mention earlier, you see the spot up here that talks about columns, like right No, stop. PowerPoint. This here. Um, MySQL finally got the ability with version eight, and I'm assuming MariaDB does also, to give privileges on specific columns. So let's say you got a table. <laughs> that was my voice. You have a table with user information in it. Cool. And you decide to grant all privileges to a user, but you want to set it so it's only specific columns so they can insert, they can insert update, delete, but only feed certain columns in. So maybe they're allowed to do 
um, full name and email address, but they're not allowed to touch the username and the password. So you could set a privilege is that a person can actually update an, another person's record without uh, being able to change the other things, which is kind of cool. All right. So if we want uh, revoke all privileges, is revoke all, or literally revoke all privileges, comma, grant option. Uh, we didn't talk about grant option yet. Um, grant option means that if you create a user with certain permissions and you give them the grant option, they can give the same permissions to someone else. They can't give anything they don't have, but they can basically duplicate everything they can do for someone else. Uh, really freaking dangerous. Um, because, well, you're letting somebody who might not know what they're doing give permission to someone else that doesn't know what they're doing either. Um, but yeah. So revoke all privileges, comma, grant option from Bob at everywhere. Cool. If Bob has a local host user, guess what? They'll still have permissions from local host. So again, got to make sure you, you groom your users properly. And, you know, all the links are there for the documentation. If you want to know what privileges a person has, it's called show grants. So you go show grants for user and you give it the user information you need and it'll give you the list what they're allowed to do. Now, <clears throat> MySQL has one stupid little quirk when it comes to privileges. Privileges do not take effect immediately. So you grant a bunch of permissions, you revoke a couple, then you're done, you do your show grants, you go, I'm perfectly happy with what this person has. Up till now, that user still doesn't have any permissions. There is a command called flush, and then there's the option, which is flush privileges. At that point, it's, it basically tells MySQL, hey, you know all your permission tables you have in memory? Reload them. So when you grant somebody pr privileges, you have two ways to make them take effect. Restart MySQL or MariaDB completely, like literally turn it off, turn it off. Or you flush their, the privileges, and it basically does the same thing as when MySQL first boots and it reads everybody's permissions into memory. That's what flush does. It tells it, hey, whatever you know about this, forget about it and reload them. Like literally flush the toilet and get clean water in again. Flush is instant, unless you've got thousands of users. Um, so some people in the past have asked me, well, why do we even need to flush the permissions? Uh, MySQL does it for performance reasons. If it does need to go to the database serve, the database table that has user permissions, every time you try to do something, it's that much IO that doesn't need to happen. So imagine you're inserting 10,000 rows, and if it had to check the permissions 10,000 times, as opposed to it's in memory, so it goes, hey, is Dan allowed to insert? Yes. Hey, is Dan allowed to insert? Yes. Hey, is Dan allowed to insert? Yes, because it's sitting in memory and the permissions are set in memory. So it does not constantly need to go to the tables. It's just cache and permissions. Uh, and, and has anybody here ever worked with software where you were trying to do something, you couldn't do it, so then you know an administrator gives you more rights, but they still don't work until you log out and log back in? It's just, that's exactly the same thing, except in this case is the administrator has to tell the server, hey, forget everything you knew about permissions. Here's the new, the new rules. And the cool thing is with this is you can update 10 different users and then flush the privileges so that all the changes take effect at the same time, not, you know, one person at a time. Okay, so that is the absolute basics. Um, this card. Did it actually take? Yes. My laptop's really, really slow when I'm recording for some unknown reason. Um, yeah. So as you can see, it's still it's still connecting. Um, oh, I don't even have the right database in here. Interesting. So.
and I don't remember the stupid syntax. Show grants. At least I hope that's going to be right. There we go. Whew, I, I remembered how to do I don't do this very often. <laughs> it's not something, well, even before I changed it, now I don't get to do it ever. Uh, but before I changed jobs, I might have done this like once every like year and a half. Because we only let two people touch the database servers. So, you know, uh, I audited the other guy, then he'd audit me. Anyways, so you see I did the show grants. And you can see that it has select, insert, update, delete, create, drop, reload, shut down, process, because I've got all permissions. Um, like if you, you can see all the permissions this user has. And it has, you know, on star dot star, it means on all databases, all objects to root. So that's actually one of the, almost one of the things in the lab. Not quite the same, but it's very close. So if you don't include that part, you get an error. You'll notice it says no such grant defined for user on host percent sign. So if you don't have the at local host or at whatever it is, right? 192.168.21, and I try to run it, it gives me an error because I don't have per the permissions don't exist for that. The on my machine, root can only connect from local host. And if you don't include this last little bit, it assumes percent sign. And what's the first rule of computing? Never assume. Why? Because it's going to blow up in your face every single time. And what's the other caveat of assuming? Every time you assume, you make an ass of you and me. People didn't get that. Oh, that's a language one that was hard. I'm not going to write that down. So every time you assume, you make an ass out of, out of you and me when we assume. Because you should never assume. Right, there we go. People are trying to get it now. So don't assume. So if I want to go... Uh, create user uh, Bob at localhost identified by password and I go run and now I go um, show grants for Bob at localhost see bob only has usage bob was created bob's not allowed to do anything they can connect and validate their password that's all they can do so if i want to go uh, grant insert update delete on flight db dot star to bob at localhost don't forget your quote marks yeah okay hang on i can maybe oh come on data grip you still let me do that settings editor font size let's go with uh 18 should be big enough. Apply. Okay. Is that better? So I want to grant insert update delete on flight DB to Bob at localhost. Helps if you type that in right. I go run. No error messages. So now if I change that back to it would have been faster to actually type it in. Like that. Now you can see I Bob has those privileges. Now, what has not happened yet is even if Bob were to connect, he still doesn't have permissions to do any of this because I've not flushed the privileges. I have not made them active. 
So if I want to give Bob privileges, I go flush privileges. I love autocomplete. And I go run, and it just ran. It doesn't even provide any output. Uh, you'll just see it completed. Now, in theory, Bob could connect and actually access flight DB. Um, hang on. Password, right? Why? That was actually accidental, but it's actually coming up with a good point. Why? Doesn't have privilege to select. Bob could actually put things in there, modify the data, but he'd be doing it completely blind. Right, so let's go give Bob privileges. So we go uh, grant uh, select on flight DB dot star to Bob at local host. Oh, come on, Dan. And run it. And if I do it, I do this here. Still doesn't work because I haven't flushed it yet. Flush, not flush, privileges, run. And still not allowed, so let's quit. And I typed that in wrong. Let's try that one more time. Look at this. Bob is now allowed. You noticed there's a lot of airports. Um, it's not the same flight, flight database you guys played with potentially last semester. Some semesters is a flight database, sometimes there's not. This is a real flight database. It has every airport in the world in it. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> We're gonna kill that for now. Um, so that's, the flush privileges does not change if the person's already connected. It only changes the next time they connect. Cool. Um, so I'll quit. And now I will uh, revoke all from, oh, the heck's the revoke syntax. I love it, the fact that I can't remember this ever. I revoke all from user. Okay, so come back here and go revoke all from Bob at localhost. It is revoke all, isn't it? Privileges, of course. There we go. Comma grant option. And if I were to go uh, flush privileges and I go go grants uh for bob at local host now he's only got usage let's go try to connect oh. say so i'm not even allowed to access flight db anymore because i took away all his rights on flight db i could actually grant usage to bob on flight db then he could connect um, so yeah, that's like half the lab I just demoed. <laughs> so the recording will be up probably by the time you guys have to do your lab. Um, so I demoed how to create a user. You watched me struggle. I changed privileges. 
watch me struggle again. Uh, gave the wrong permissions, which is good because it, you know, gave you guys the time to think about what the permissions were actually doing. Um, and then I nuked the user, and you can see the behavior from start to end of how it behaves. Honestly, for user level permissions, that's all there is to it. To access the server, like controlling what a user can do on the server. The problem is, is doing it is easy. Planning it is hard. It's figuring out what the rules are. Like, what should that user be allowed to do? Where should they be allowed to do it from? Um, uh, some database servers, such as Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, can tell even limit you when you can do things. You're only allowed to connect between 9 and 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. EST. You can even limit when a person can connect and do stuff, which is very fine grained. Um, security for is as good as your plan. You can give the best permissions set in the world, and then person walks up to the server and just takes your shit. Right? It's not good. Um, this is where I'll give you guys, before I wrap it up for today, a small anecdote about why you want to secure your servers physically. Um, company I was at before I was at Health Canada, I, I started there in 1990, no, in 2000, um, June 1st, 2000. How do you know the date? Because I accepted the job offer my, the day my daughter was born in May. So, you know, it's easy to remember when I started there. Um, the server room had no ventilation. So what did they do to keep the server room clear, cool? They left the door open. And they had a fan in front of the door just to keep the air moving in. It was a small company. They'd only been around for like five years at that point, And they trusted everybody in the company implicitly. And then we had a tech support agent who decided to be clever and do some corporate espionage. Eh? Corporate espionage. He decided to spy on the partners. So he went to the server room. He didn't access the database servers. He accessed our mail server or email server. And he put a forwarding rule on all the partners in the email boxes. So that every time they got an email, he got a copy. Dude thought he was really smart. Dude was not smart. He was forwarding him to his email address at the company. I <laughs> know. You know, it's like, I'm, I do a smart, but I'm dumb as a post. He sent it outside to an anonymous mailbox. There's no way they could ever figure out who it was because there was no security. So, yeah, we figured out who it was. He got fired, obviously. Um, and pro charges were pressed, you know. Um, believe it or not, the criminal charges for corporate espionage are pretty harsh. <laughs> They're pretty bad. Um, but, yeah, uh, actually, it went well for us for because he got deported back to Columbia. So, to Columbia. So he went back home where his family had been chased out of the country originally by one of the cartels. So he disappeared. Uh, justice was served. Anyways, so after that day, the server room was closed. They got a portable air conditioner and they just put the vent into the ceiling. So at least you know, it was venting the hot air somewhere else. And, you know, only three people had keys to the door. Physical access was restricted. Never trust the meat sacks because it's always the meat sack that's going to cause your problems. We're just lucky he didn't do it to the accounting system. Or to something else. Like if he had even half a brain more, he could have done all kinds of interesting things. Like K Tech, our entire customer list, and sell it to one of the competitors for money. And with the door open, we never would have known who did it. Yes. Security starts with making sure people can't touch your stuff. Then you just set up your permissions so that they can't do anything else after they touch it. And that is the end of today's lecture. Um, the lab should be fairly straightforward. I did, you know, two thirds of the example, like the examples I did on screen would be two thirds of what the lab is involved. So. It is a brand new lab though. Please take pity on me. I literally completely rewrote it 
so that we didn't have to use MySQL Workbench to do the lab. Because MySQL Workbench didn't work on Mac at all. So I decided to go old school, make you guys type in the commands instead of click, 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 click on the UI, which is typing the commands is actually a much better learning exercise. Okay, so I will see those that are going to lab in lab. If you're not going to lab, that's cool. Yes. Okay, let me go because they used to be the other way around. I just got to go fix the dates. Let me go fix that momentarily.